Excellent. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast this evening. We have a magnificent guest with us today, one who is going to give us some amazing information as well as inspiration. And that is none other than our brother, all the, all the way from Mosque number seven, um, Brother Raymond. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam, sir. Thank you very much for uh, coming and uh, honoring us with your presence. On behalf of myself, my family, and the viewing audience of the People's Podcast, we just want to thank you again and thank all who are watching. The first question that we have for you, sir, is when did you hear the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Now, it's funny. Um, first, be before I answer the question, I want to say um, out loud <clears throat> and publicly that this podcast is so important. Um, when I was listening to Dr. Aleem on your podcast, and he was saying that one of the things that we don't do in the nation as believers, we don't write books, so we don't chronicle our history. We don't write our story. So the person who is writing the history seems like they are the victor in the war or the battle. So this podcast, I think I said this to you personally, but I want to say it to you publicly. This is the book that Dr. Aleem was talking about. Every person who comes on to your podcast and tells their story or shares their journey with the wise man, this is the book. I mean, all you have to do is take it from audio video to put it in print form. And this is the book that's going to chronicle the history that our children are going to look back years from now and say, oh, this is what my father did. Oh, this is what my grandmother did. Oh, this was the struggle. This is why these things are so important and we have to maintain what we have or what we have acquired in the nation of Islam. So I just wanted to thank you, brother, for having thank me. You, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, and thank you very much. And thank you everyone who's watching. My sister, Miriam, so that's making like salam me. And thank everyone who's watching all across the country. Can't wait to put this on YouTube. Please let us know what city you all are watching from. Okay, now, Brother Raymond, when did you first hear the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Now, it's funny because I have family members that were already members of the Nation of Islam, but they were not pushy Muslims. You know, they lived their Muslim life and, you know, there were certain things that they didn't do and we made accommodations for them, but they didn't push, you know, the religion down your throat like you Negroes need to be Muslim, blah, 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 blah. So I knew that they were Muslim in my family. I just didn't know what, you know, what it was about in detail. But in 1992, um, I was a freshman. No, I wasn't. I was, a, I think I was a uh, sophomore or junior at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, and I went into the Black Cultural Center and there was a Final Call newspaper on the table. And the headline was Black and White, Solution to the Race Problem. Mm, mm. And I put it under my arm and I stole it. I walked out with it. <laughs> mm, and when mm. I got home and I started reading the article, which was the Savior's Day address from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I said immediately, this is the answer. And I didn't call my cousin. I didn't call my uncle. I didn't call, you know, what I did was I flipped to the back of the Final Call newspaper and I called Chicago. Mm. Where do they do this? Where do I sign up? Because I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't believe at that time with that amount of information that there wasn't a mosque or a temple or a learning center in every city in America. I didn't know that I would have to drive two hours away to Richmond, Virginia, which would be the closest city. And that's where I accepted Islam mm. oh, in 1992. Beautiful. Yes, sir. And what was it like for you on the campus of Virginia Tech um, in 1992 after you heard the teachings? How did that affect you in, as far well, as college was concerned? Well, it was always contentious for me because I was a rebel without a pause. Um, I was in school during the time of the Rodney King and um, that stuff. So um, always protesting, always you know down for the cause. Every Everything that was black, I had my hands on it. Um, because it was a small black community. I think it was 1,200 black students and this was a, a PWI, 
a predominantly white school. I think there may have been somewhere between 45 and 50,000 students in total. Only 1,200 were black. So mm -hmm. we all knew each other. Um, I can remember a time um, I used to have public enemy posters because that was popular at the time. And I put them on my on the front of my door of my dormitory. And I can remember coming back to my dorm and seeing they were burnt off. They didn't rip them down. They burnt the door. Mm. So that was the climate. That was the, that was 1992. Wow. Yes, sir. And how did your family and friends feel about you accepting the teaching? Um, it was mixed. It was mixed. Um, um, I come, I come from a church background. Um, my father was a Methodist uh, pastor, so he didn't say anything openly, but, you know, he didn't, you know, like, what is this? You know, I, I raised you to be Methodist, blah, blah, blah. Um, but at, over time, watching me grow and watching me change, watching the person that I was becoming, it became easier for people to accept because they liked Brother Raymond way more than they liked Cool Ray. Mm. I can assure you, they like Brother Raymond a lot more. Wonderful, yes, sir. And once you accepted in Richmond, what were the like? What was the training like? The climbing like in the mosque in Richmond? Like, who were the laborers, and what was that like in Richmond? So here's the here's the thing. When I when I came to the mosque in Richmond, I came on a Sunday. I came to join. Um. There was a minister teaching, his name was Douglas X. Um, he was the first person that I saw or witnessed the minister give a holy name. Um, not during that moment, but later on during that year, the minister came to Richmond and did um, a lecture. And in that moment, um, he introduced him and he gave them the holy name of uh, Minister Abdul Hassan Muhammad. Mm. Um, so that was. Uh, a thing, a treat within and of itself. But when I came to the mosque, like I said, I came to join. So um, I came suited and booted, looking like I was Farrakhan recruited. And I stood up and they told me I had to come back on Monday night. When I came back Monday night, I wore the suit that I had on on Sunday. I had a white shirt and I had the bow tie that I had just purchased um, that Sunday afternoon after the mosque meeting. Um, I guess it's customary that when first time, you know, when you stand up, when you come, you go into orientation class. Brother Joshua, I didn't go to orientation class. I mm -hmm. came to the mosque on Monday night. They threw me straight into the FOI. Mm -hmm. Left face, right face, about face. Yeah, I picked it up. You know, I was in the FOI for six months before I even knew that there was an FOI class. I mean, an orientation mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. I was sitting and talking with some brothers and they were telling me all the things that they went through in orientation. I said, orientation, we got that. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> so I never went to orientation. In fact, that first night they asked me to put in my paper order. I put in my first paper order for 500 papers. <laughs> I carried 500 papers for three weeks. Mm. You know, uh, I, I quit jobs because I had met people there who they had an impact on my life. Like the first uh, Lieutenant was a brother by the name of Sylvester, dark skinned brother with a gold tooth. Now, you know, it's, couple, it's a couple of type of gold teeth that you can have, brother. You can have, you know, the gold fronts that the young people put in their mouth today. Yes, sir. Or you can go down to Mexico and you can get, you know, the gold cap around your tooth or whatever. But there's another gold tooth that you can only get from one place. And that is the penitentiary. Mm, mm. You know, so there's certain people that have that penitentiary gold. You know what I mean? <laughs> so this brother had that tooth and he was dark skinned and he was strong and fiery. And I was just so moved by um, his militancy and his righteous conduct like i just you know wanted to be around him i just wanted to see him i just wanted to look at him and you know he was a great leader he was a great mentor he was you know a leader of man i was young in that day i see him 
from time to time now it's Savior's Day. But, you mm. know, back when I, when I joined the Moms Brother Joshua, I was so quiet, you know, trying to just sit on the wall and learn as much as I could. I don't even think the brother remembers who I am. But every mm. time I see him, I thank him for the influence that he had on my life and changing my life. But it's always in passing. So we've never had a conversation. Maybe if he sees this, you know, um, he lives out in Arizona now. Maybe if he sees this, he'll remember, you know, little brother Raymond from Moss number 24 um, in 1992. But I met a bunch of great brothers. I met a brother named Brother Matthew X, a brother William X, who uh, another brother who I saw the minister change his name to Muhammad um, for his sales of the Final Call newspaper. Mm -hmm. He was selling mm -hmm. thousands of papers back when they were selling thousands of papers. And he had bought a house. He had bought a car. He had, you know, secured, um, um, you know, the things that make your wife and family secure just by the sales of the Final Call newspaper and mm. the VHS tapes and the cassette tapes at that time. And I went out soldiering with him one time and he would take three, four bundles of newspapers and sit them on the um, concrete divider in the middle of this, um, the highway or the intersection. And one day I said to him, brother, why do you come out here and do this every day? Because I'm talking to him and he's very smart. And I'm thinking that he could be a manager or a, he could be anything that he wanted to be other than selling the Final Call newspaper. And he looked at me with a straight face and he said, brother, if I don't do this, Allah is going to kill me. Mm. And in that moment, he transferred all of that conviction onto me. And I've carried that with me, my entire sojourn in the nation of Islam. Mm. Yeah, well, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Captain Alfred was the captain when I came in. He's still the captain to this day. I believe he's mm. probably the longest serving captain in the nation of Islam. If not, if he's a, he's one of them. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. Captain Alfred is still holding it down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Okay. Now, um, how did you, when did you go to see the Most High Missile Farrakhan from someone who was a speaker or maybe an activist to someone who was in fact divinely guided? Um, I don't want to say immediately, but immediately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, I was in the mosque. Um, I stood up on these words. Who wants to come and join on and help the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. That's what I stood up for. Um, I said to a person um, a few years ago that I thought this whole thing would be over in five years. If I had known that the white man would still be on the planet ruling and doing the thing, I never would have joined the nation. I would have waited. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I, would, mm. I would have got some more filth, you know, <laughs> under my belt. <laughs> but, um, I was in the mosque probably for six months, like I said, before I heard someone say the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, the exalted Christ. And I said, what? What the? Hold on. Oh, wait a minute, buddy. Wait a minute. But, you know, it was because I didn't come for that. I didn't come for it. I didn't come for religion. I came to help the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan help black people. And I didn't even consider this was a religion. I didn't mm. even consider that there was a spiritual theology that was tied to it. So I came for one reason, but I found so many other reasons to stay. Mm. And I always tell people, I always, um, um, it's a little um, hyperbolic when I say it, but I always tell people that I'm way more pragmatic than I am spiritual. Mm, but mm. really, the reality is the pragmatic things that we do when we do the right thing, it's already wrapped up in the scriptures. And you can find scriptures and you can find the spiritual things that back it up. Thanks. Yes, sir. So you don't have to dwell on, well, what's, what scripture is this? What uh, text did this come from? If you're doing the right thing, let somebody else find the text that it comes from. You just do it. Beautiful. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, Brother Raymond, how did you get from 
Richmond to New York. Okay. <laughs> I married young. I divorced early. Yada yada yada. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Million Man March. Um, now I'm in the city. <laughs> to uh, 1996. 1996. Okay, okay so. Yes, sir. So I want to go to the Mayman March, though. What was yes, that, sir. What was the climate like leading up to the Mayman March, and how did it personally impact you? Oh, that was incredible. That was the first time um, that I realized that I had the ability to do certain things that I didn't have the confidence to do before I became uh, a Muslim. I mean, I had the confidence to do wrong, but I didn't have the confidence to stand in front of people and do right and talk about right and you know, um, the Million Man March was a labor of love, of knocking on doors, shaking hands, kissing babies, passing out flyers, passing out, um, distributing the paper, um, back and forth trips to Washington, D.C. It was just a lot. Um, so um, it was a test. I did lose um, quite a few jobs during that time. <laughs> There was, you know, a few times when I had to tell, you know, the slave master, hey, listen, the master needs me. Mm, Gotta go. Mm, mm. But again, that was my conviction during that time. And I was young. So um, like I've heard the Supreme Captain say, I was young and I was single. So um, a single man, when you eat, your whole family eats. So you sacrifice differently when you're single. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks. Yes, sir. Okay. So then... Once you came to New York, what was the training like then? Um, Captain Dennis Muhammad, if I, if I have to say anything more. <laughs> yes, sir, um, yes, sir. Then when he transitioned out of the city, um, Anthony Five was the first lieutenant, acting captain. And I was a squad leader under him. And I can remember sitting in meetings now, I'm 51 years old um, tomorrow on Sunday. Right. I'll be 51 years old. But I can remember sitting in meetings with them because at the time, 20-year-olds were running the mosque. Mm. Captain Dennis was probably the oldest person in the mosque at that time. So in the meetings, we were, well, they were, I was just listening, um, contemplating things like, Anybody that's in the mosque that's over 40 is automatically in the diamond squad. Mm. We don't ask them, we don't ask them to sell papers, we don't ask them to hold post, we don't ask them, you know. That was then. Because we again, we were all younger men. So young men, for whatever reason, don't see far enough into the future to see the value in older human beings. Mm. Like we were putting people out to pastor pastor during that time. Yes, sir. Um, also, um, during that time, um, so 96 and yada yada and over some years that there's a blur, but I also spent some time um, assisting Minister Arthur now, who's over mosque number seven in the ministry. Mm. Um, but I was, I was assisting him when we were building um, a study group in Mount Vernon. I, I was his assistant minister then. I would open up for him. Um, yeah, I would open up for him. I didn't become a, a lieutenant or an officer until 2001. Yeah, 2001. So, yes, and you're still and you're still an officer now, correct? I am not. I am not. You're not. You're not, I am not. Now. Okay, yes, sir. Praise be. Praise be to Allah. Yes. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, well, what, um, well, let me say. Let me let me say this. Let me lay. Let me lay it like this. Um, I was a squad leader. Um, on, off, on, then off, and then I became a lieutenant under. Uh, captain Richard in his tenure. I think he came on as the captain in 2000. In 2000. I became a lieutenant under him in 2001. Mm. And, he was very, and he was very reluctant to do so. Mm. Um, 
One thing I can say about Captain Richard is, and this is not good or bad, but he doesn't like to deal with anything that has not been tried and tested. Mm. So um, with that being said, if there was someone who had done the position before who was there, I wouldn't have been considered. Mm, mm. But because the lieutenant that we had had moved out of the city and I was the only one left um, who had had any experience in that capacity, then I got the job. Mm, mm. I, always, I always say that I'm the least likely candidate for all of the positions that I've ever been in, um, in the mosque. Because, you know, in most cities, when you go, um, it's based on um, things that uh, human nature. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, um, it's the good looking brother who gets, you know, the position. It's the, per it's the person with the fair skin, the nice hair, the good car, the nice job, the person who has the most flexibility of time and is least likely to lose his job. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Those are the those are the people who usually naturally get selected. And sometimes when we select them, they don't have the ability to do the job. Mm. They look the part, but they don't have the ability to do the job. So now I'm a lieutenant in Westchester. Westchester is a suburb of uh, New York City, um, but it has three and a half million people. Um, I was the Westchester Lieutenant probably for a year, maybe two years. And then um, the long serving uh, Bronx Lieutenant, Brother Franklin, AKA Alamel, um, the self-proclaimed Muslim guy. Mm -hmm. um, one of my mentors, my brother, I love him immensely. I will miss him dearly, um, but he transitioned out of being a Lieutenant. They, they transitioned him into the ministry force for a short period of time. So during that time, because um, there was no one in the Bronx who had been tried and tested, I got that job too. Mm, mm. So, I'm, so I'm the Lieutenant over Westchester. I'm the Lieutenant over the Bronx. Fast forward, maybe a half a year later, there was a transition in Manhattan. So, I'm the lieutenant in Westchester. I'm the lieutenant in the Bronx. I'm the lieutenant in Manhattan. Mm. So, I, so I created a letterhead and the letterhead said, Brother Raymond Muhammad, Triborough Commander. Mm, 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 mm. And uh, Minister Kevin, uh, Minister Abdul Hafiz, Minister Kevin at the time, may Allah be pleased with him, may saw the letterhead. Pleased. And he said, hmm, what's this? I said, that's me. Oh, that's who you, that's your position? I said, yes, I'm the lieutenant over the Bronx, Manhattan, and Westchester. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> then, then he took issue with the words borough commander. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like that. He said, that's police talk. That's what, that's, the, that's what the police use. That's how they communicate. So I explained to him, I said, listen, that was the... Um, language that we got from uh, regional captain Abdul Muhammad Abdul Aziz when he was over the city mm, mm. Um, back in 97. So it stuck, you know, uh, we had a breakdown of uh, line lieutenant, you know, squad leaders, line lieutenants, um, uh, lead lieutenants, point lieutenants, and borough commanders. So it made sense after I explained it to him, but he did not like that language, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Didn't like it at all. So, um, my first officer, my first lieutenant, uh, was Brother Kem Muhammad. I say my first officer because everybody, every FOI in the nation has someone, an officer, that has affected their lives in such a way that it sticks with them. And that's always going to be their guy. You know what I mean? Like you may have had a captain that was so great. And every time you see him, you say, that's my captain. Every time you see him, that was my first lieutenant. Oh, that was my, you understand what I'm saying? 
So for me, that was Brother Kim. Brother Kim is from Long Island out in Amityville. Uh, when he was the first officer over the city, he took me under his wing and he just showed me so much about um, managing people, managing um, information, um, tracking and setting metrics and all these different things. He would say, brother, every time I see you, I want you to have a pen and a notebook or a pen and a clipboard in your hand. Write down everything. And I took that and I still use that to, uh, to this day. Brother mm. Kim was a type of brother. He was a type of first lieutenant who could see charts. I mean, who could see patterns in men, patterns in the ranks because he took meticulous notes. He created forms and he would tell me, Brother Raymond, I want you to create a form for this. I want you to create a form for that. So we had a form for everything. So if he called me, I had a form for that. I had a form to write down the time that he called me, the amount of time that we spent on the phone, what he said to me, how I gave it back to him, and what he wanted me to do with the information that he gave it to me. Mm -hmm. Then I would have to call the men under my charge. There's another form for that. What time did you call them? Did they pick up? Did they not pick up? Did the answer machine come on? Did you leave a voicemail? Right? Um, what did you say to them? What was the response? And then you come back and you compile all this information and you have a database of information that you can use to help you manage the men. Every time I ask this brother to do something on Saturday, he always says, no, he has to work. Mm. Feel me? Yes, sir. So why do I keep wasting my time calling him if I know I got a Saturday detail? I call the Saturday brothers. So because of that, we were able to track and get patterns, you know, on the FOI so that we, when we asked them, we could get the most out of them. So yes, that was brother, that was brother Kim. That was my first lieutenant. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. And we're Raymond, people are showing you love all across the country. Uh, my sister Naima says, colorism is real. Uh, brother Nelson Ramos says, I'm some Lakin family from Connecticut. Lakin Salam. And thank you Praise all. Be to Allah. And I can't wait to put this on YouTube. Let us know what city you all are watching from as well. <clears throat> I'm just reading all of these comments. Boom. Perfect. Thank you very much. People saying excellent. Uh, what is your favorite memory uh, with Minister Hafiz, sir? Mm. I have a bunch um, of memories, but, you know, the thing, the thing that stick out the most is the chastisements. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Because he was a gentle giant, but um, he ruled, you know, I always say that when you, when you cross the line from private soldier into an officer or something like that, when you cross that line, you're on the side where the gloves are off. Mm. So the gentle giant that you see, you know, was not always the managing partner behind closed doors. So it was a it was a wild relationship because, you know, he would beat me up real good and then put his arm around me and we go back outside <laughs> to, the, to the general public. <laughs> yes, sir, yes, sir, and yes, I have sir. to walk and I have to walk straight like I'm not wounded. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, uh, but just a bunch of, of, of memories um, traveling with him learning so much um, because uh, Hafiz is a name given to someone who has memorized the Quran. Mm. But I don't know if that's why that was given to him. I mean, he's very knowledgeable of the Quran, but it's the Hadith of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that he has memorized everything that the minister has ever said to him. And he can recall the time, date, you know, on command. And, you know, because I have the type of memory that I have, when you say something to me one time and you're saying it again, I'm measuring it for truth and accuracy. Yes, sir, yes, sir. And it's always the same. It was always the same with him. 
Mm. He mm. never missed. He never missed a mark. Not when it came to the words of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. It's going to forever miss him. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. May Allah be pleased. Um, and thank you, sir, for your great testimony. And um, oh, you said you said, brother uh, Ramos, for showing love from Massachusetts. Yes, sir. Got it, brother Ramos. I'm a picture of Connecticut, Massachusetts. Praise right, be to Allah. Um, yes, sir. Now I wanted to ask you. Um, Fear. Have you ever been faced with fear? And if so, how have you overcome that fear? Yeah, um, all the time. Um, faith and belief in Allah. Um, yeah, I don't even know how to answer that, but all the time, even now, you know, I'm afraid to fail for my family. You know, um, give you a give you a quick example, right? Because for the most part, my family, my children only knew me as an officer, as a lieutenant, because I served on the captain's staff for just over 18 years. When they were born, I was a lieutenant. I served as the uh, first lieutenant nearly nine years. Mm. Um, so I can name, I can account for um, off the top of my head, at least um, during the tenure of this particular of this captain, eleven first lieutenants. Mm, mm. So if I did seven to nine of those years, that means each of them only did a year. Some of them only lasted six months. New mm -hmm. York is a hard mm -hmm. city. It's a hard city. But my children don't know me as being a failure or not accomplishing things because I drive so hard. So just a few days ago, uh, my daughter called me from Virginia. Uh, she's on vacation, but she's a student at Seton Hall University. Mm. And she says, listen, I need the money for my room and board. How much is it? And just very cavalier, she says it's $17,000. It's mm. due August 2nd. Mm. Brother Joshua, I ain't got $17,000. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But I'm afraid to fail for my family. I can't afford to fail. I can't afford to fail. I have too. I mean, I have too. I have way too many people uh, using me to pull themselves up, and I'm keenly aware of that. I'm keenly aware of how people respond uh, to me. One because of the position of leadership that I was in. And um, two, probably because of my own personal personality. I remember one night going into a fast food joint um, up here in New York. We have uh, what's called Kennedy fried chicken. Mm. And it was, you know, late at night. I wasn't married at the time. Um, maybe one or two o'clock in the morning coming out of an FOI class on a Monday night. Rolled into Kennedy's fried chicken and a brother saw me. And he said, oh, brother, that's you? I didn't know Kennedy was good. So my presence put a stamp on it. Mm, mm. And it's not good. I mean, it's not bad. It's, they don't do pork, but it's fried chicken. So you have to be aware of the people around you and that people are using you to pull themselves up. I'm mm. not unaware of that. I'm not unaware of that. Praise be to all our excellent teaching, Brother Randy. Yes, sir. And thank you, everyone, who continues to show love all across the country. We have a quick 60-second commercial break follow the sponsors of the People's Podcast. And please let us put, um, when we get back, please put the comments and questions that we have for our brother, Brother Raymond. One second. And thank you very much, sir, for your uh, great um, interview so far. It's been excellent. Uh, moment. We thank you for every like, share, and subscription all over YouTube and anonymous cash app to the People's Podcast. We greatly appreciate it. Too. One second. Here we go. A camera and a drone. He does television and film editing. Please reach out to him if you need any of those services. Sister Miriam's ABC I Love Me children's book and coloring book and now Spanish book. All three available on Amazon.com. Sister Naima's Stay On Point Dance Academy LLC. She teaches ballet virtually to young girls all across the country, right here in the studios of Atlanta, Georgia. 
Brother Kenneth's bow tie maker extraordinaire. He'll ship you bow ties anywhere across the nation. Dr. Henry Carter's King Henry Turkey Legs, right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Rashad Muhammad's COVID-19 Disinfected Cleaning Services, out of Chicago. Student Minister Sharif Muhammad's book, A Soldier in a Movement of Christ, available on adulsharif.com. And lastly, Brother Joshua Muhammad's book, Cleopatra, as well as No Father, No Excuse, both available on Amazon. Perfect. Yes, sir. And Brother Raymond, do you have a yes, text, sir. sir, that we can uh, show love to you as far as helping and assisting your daughter with her um, room and board? Say that one more time. Do you have your a cash app so that we can assist you, people who are watching who want to show love to your uh, daughter uh, and assisting you with helping your daughter with her room and board at, at um, Seton Hall? Oh, praise is due to Allah. Which of the favors of Allah will you deny? Uh, yes, my cash app is dollar sign Raymond Muhammad. Right. If you pull it up, you'll see a um, dark skinned, bald headed brother just like me wearing a black t shirt. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, everyone who's watching, uh, I'm, I'm in college right now, and, I, and, and uh, my expenses. Nowhere near 17,000, so I can only imagine for room board. So, uh, <laughs> yes, sir, and I'm over here dealing with mine, so I can only imagine. So, let's make sure we all show love to our brother Raymond as well as his family. And on behalf of myself, my family, and the viewing audience of the People's Podcast, we thank a lot for you, sir, and the sacrifices Praise that you Allah. and the sacrifices of your family. So, please let your family know that we are very appreciative to you all for all the work that Praise you have done, Allah. are doing, and will continue to do, inshallah. Yes, sir. The next question I have for you is, what uh, is the greatest joy in your life, sir? The teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm, mm. <laughs> um, not to sound like a parrot or anything, but there is no greater joy than to recite the teachings of the most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, mm. Scoring 50 points in a ball game, running 16 touchdowns, running a marathon, climbing Mount Everest, nothing compares to this. Because this is, um, there's so much depth, depth to this. This is what is going to change the world. Beautiful. Yes, sir. All right. My next question for you is the, the minister, has he come? Have you been able to uh, secure him when he came in and out of New York City during your tenure as an officer, sir? <laughs> have I? <laughs> We wrote, we wrote uh, volumes and volumes on securing the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan mm, mm. in New York City. Um, it has been said, now, I'm, I'm saying this um, out loud because maybe we can, we'll use this portion of, um, as a teaching tool and inspiration for other cities that are watching. But it has been said um, by E-team members that when we come to New York City, we love it because we get to take a break. Mm. Mm. Because New York City puts together a machine when it's time to receive the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. We don't sleep. It's FOE, Farrakhan over everything. Over everything. But I remember the first time I, I uh, secured the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, uh, <laughs> it was in Richmond, Virginia. Mm. Um, I think it may have been at the Omni Hotel, may have been a different hotel. Don't quote me on the hotel. But I remember being on the elevator on the floor um, of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And we only had one instruction. Don't let anybody get off this elevator and come on this floor. Mm. <laughs> so there were these two beautiful Black sisters on the elevator. One of them even worked at the hotel. Blind instruction. And sister, you can't, you can't get off here. I don't want to do nothing to Farrakhan. You ain't even, you ain't even guarding Farrakhan. Y'all just guarding the guards. Oh, she hurt me so bad. <laughs> she said, you won't even see Farrakhan, nigga. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and she was right. Mm. I didn't see Farrakhan. <laughs> I didn't see Farrakhan. But, you know, later over the years, I learned that there's value in guarding the guards. Mm. There's value in that. You know, um, 
these people who secure the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, these believers, they can't be on 24 seven as much as they try, as much as they, you know what I mean? Someone has to come and give them a level of relief. So that's what we do. Um, and New York was a great training ground for that. Um, man, we did so many things with New York, in New York with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Um, I can remember um, putting together a plain clothes detail one time for him in the city. Mm. And we had, so I overdid it. We had too many brothers down in the city and he was driving through and someone who was in the car with him said later that he said, I know those brothers. Oh. They're trying to hide from me. We just didn't do a good job of hiding. <laughs> <laughs> just didn't do a good job. <laughs> Wonderful. No, yes, that, sir. That's a great pleasure in and of itself. Praise me to a lot. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask you advice for future husbands. What advice would you give? Oh, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> consult with your wife. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, um, I don't really know. I don't really know because my situation is so different. I met my wife nearly over 30 years ago when we were in college. We've been married for 21 years. Mm. So she knew uh, Cool Ray. She likes Brother Raymond way more than <laughs> she likes Cool Ray. So the change in the responsible Black man, the man on a mission, is more lovable than just some Negro out in the street trying to be cool. Mm. So mm. my situation my situation is a little bit different because my wife was tailor-made and custom-made for me. If she wasn't who she was, I wouldn't be married today. Mm. I mm. would crush the average sister in the mosque because, mm. like she says of me, I don't have an off switch. I'm always off. I am the most rigid, the most focused, the most far con over everything person that you will ever meet. Mm. You know, um, I quit my job to be the first officer of the mosque. Mm. And I came in and made that announcement. So, you know, the average sister, I would be, I would have been sleeping on your couch, brother Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> but she was, she was tailor made for me. So I don't, I really don't know, really don't know. My interaction with my interactions with other women hasn't been great over the years, mm. but this one was custom made by a law for me. Beautiful, praise be so a lot. And what advice would you give to future fathers, sir? Um, try to spend, you know, time with your children. Um, there is a, there is a, uh, a lot of work that has to be done in the nation. And it's not gonna get done overnight. And just by you running and um, let's say putting everything on this side of the scale and nothing on that side of the scale, um, that doesn't help to build our nation because we mm. can't build a nation with fallen families. And I remember uh, there were times when I was so busy and so involved in the work that my adolescent children would ask me things like, daddy, are you coming to my recital? And when I was like, of course I'm coming to you. And they would give me that, well, you say, of course, but there's always a meeting or a conference call or, you know, don't be too busy for your children. Because to be honest with you, even though I was present, I feel like I missed the first half of their life. Mm. As a matter of fact, I can remember coming in one day and maybe I was stepping over some garbage or something. And um, my oldest daughter now was about eight years old at that time. And I'm barking out instructions and why is this garbage here and all this other stuff. And she said, hold up, we live here. <laughs> you mm. can't just come here making up rules. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's when I realized I needed to spend more time home. Beautiful, yes, sir. Beautiful, excellent lessons. Okay, well, uh, Brother Raymond, you being in New York City, I look forward to hearing your answer because we asked all of our guests what is their favorite album of all time. I would like to know what is your favorite album of all time, sir. Um, 
I'm stuck between Yo Bum Rush the Show and A Rebel Without a Pause. Mm, mm. Because that was what introduced me to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Mm. Farrakhan's a prophet. I think you ought to listen to what he can say to you. What you ought to do is follow for now. How do people say? Make the miracle. Deep pump the lyric up. You know what I mean? I didn't even know at the time when he was talking about power that he was referencing the power products that the minister mentioned, that the minister launched through a Madison Square Garden. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Didn't even know. That's powerful. Who would have, who would have thought? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I, and I have to say, um, for everyone who's watching, please go back and uh, watch the interview I did with uh, Chuck D, the um, People's Podcast interview I did with Professor Griff. As well as the S1W, where I show love to the people podcast, thank all of them. That is the number one album that is always <laughs> mentioned. From, I'm literally like, we, we did a poll on how many times you asked my favorite album. And it's either that for the sisters, Miseducation of Lauren Hill, and then for the younger people, some ratchet stuff that I would listen to. But uh, but majority of the believers who, you know, yes, say your generation, they will say they heard Chuck D say for all kinds of profit that I think you should listen to. Because that was the culture that really fished us in. Um, it was a cultural revolution during that time. Um, it was almost like Mao Zedong in China, mm. putting the teachings into music, into mm. art. And, you know, so we were being fed it so that when it was given to us directly, we didn't reject it mm. because we already knew what it was. It felt natural. Powerful. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And will you ever write a book about your personal life, sir? I'm writing my book right now as we speak on your podcast. <laughs> this is my book, sir. <laughs> this is my book. So um, I don't want to usurp the questions or anything like that, but I do want to speak about um, um, my time as a first lieutenant. Mm, let's, let's talk about it. Because I think that there are some things that um, we did that could be helpful and beneficial around the nation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, first of all, when I became the second lieutenant, I was an over-the-road truck driver. And um, I was the le least likely candidate, again, for the job. <laughs> After everything that I told you, um, borough commander, Westchester, Bronx, Manhattan, Westchester, Bronx, Manhattan at the same time, uh, you know, proven track record, right? When the captain was looking for a, first, a second lieutenant, I was the least likely candidate. Mm. I was I was suggested to him by a mentor, friend, former first lieutenant, um, Brother Forrest Muhammad. And he told him, no, the brother's not seasoned enough. Mm. So Brother Forrest went to bat for me, fighting to give me a job that I didn't even know that was being offered to me. Mm, mm. All of this was behind the scenes, right? So he told, you know, they informed me about this later. And I was an over-the-road truck driver. And I said, I can't do this um, and not be in the city. Um, but he um, acquiesced and I became the second lieutenant. Um, because I spent so much time on the road, by myself, I could make phone calls and I could think. So because I'm naturally a problem solver, if you called me on Monday with a problem, if you talk to me again on Tuesday or Wednesday and you mentioned that same problem, I'm thinking that you're absurd or crazy because mm, I already mm. solved that problem. Mm. Now, never mind the fact that I didn't talk to anybody and share the solution. But I'm like, damn, we still talking about that? Today, mm. so I was able to solve a lot of problems and to um, create in my mind a lot of systems that I use that I carried over into being the first lieutenant. Mm. So um, a few months after being second lieutenant, um, the first lieutenant and I switched positions. But I knew that I couldn't be the uh, first lieutenant and be absent five days out of the week. So I quit my job to be the first officer of the mosque. Mm. I came in and I announced to my wife, I'm quitting my job. She said, what are we going to do? 
I said, I think we're going to be in the food business. Mm. <laughs> mm, mm. So um, what we did was we set up tents on the sidewalk in New York City. And we built an outdoor kitchen, mm. a makeshift restaurant right in front of the mosque. And we served the believers and the believers supported us. And that's how I took care of my family um, during some of the years when I was the first lieutenant. Then later, a few believers complained, Brother Raymond's taking up too many parking spaces. You know, in mm. New York, parking is big. Mm. It's mm. a big mm. thing. <laughs> so even two parking spaces, you know what I mean? is a lot for New York. It was too much for them to handle. He's got to go. <laughs> mm. So um, we packed up ship and we moved um, to another location. Still on a sidewalk. You know, we worked, we brokered a deal with um, a dentist office that was not far from the mosque. And we set up there uh, three days a week. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And that's how we managed during the first few years um, that I was the first lieutenant. Um, one, of the, one of the things, um, when you talk to officers in the Nation of Islam who have been doing this for any number of years, and you say to them um, to do something that has to do with interacting with the people under their charge. They would rather send a text message. Nobody wants to communicate face to face mm. or nobody wants to communicate mouth to mouth. Nobody wants human interaction. And the first thing they would say is, I don't have time for this BS. And I flipped it because my motto was as the first lieutenant, I make time for BS. So when you text someone, if you text me, brother, can you come to the blah, 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 blah. And I text you back one word, no. What did you learn from that? Mm. You, didn't feel, you didn't feel my spirit. You couldn't hear the inflection of my voice. You don't know whether I was angry, whether I was sad, whether I was disappointed that I couldn't go. It wasn't like, no, I can't make it this time, but next time keep me in mind. It wasn't like, Hell no, I would never do anything with you. You can't get that unless you interact with human beings. So you have to make time for BS. You have to make time for human interaction. When I was the first lieutenant, I would field anywhere between 50 and 75 phone calls a day. Mm. Anywhere between 50 and 75 phone calls. And I looked beyond the need um, of the mosque into the need of the believer. Because if you're going to be over men and you're going to shepherd men, you have to have a level of care in your heart for the people that you are in charge of. Mm. And once you start to satisfy their needs, then you can start getting the things that you want from them. Give you a case in point. There was a brother who came into the captain's office once to see me, and I was ready to read him the riot act because of his activity and whatever was going on, mm -hmm. right? And he started talking to me about his wife, who was an MGT. I'm not going to mention the brother or the wife, but I'm going to be honest with you, brother Joshua. I couldn't pick his, his wife out in a police lineup. Mm -hmm. I had no idea who she was. But he started talking to me and we started talking and holding hands. And eventually we, we weren't sitting in the chairs no more. Now we're sitting on the floor and he's crying and I'm crying. And, you know, he has it's a serious problem that he was going through. We must have cried together for maybe 20, 30 minutes. Mm. And I promise you, I could not help him with his problem. I had nothing for him. No suggestions, no nothing. But because I took the time, when I came to the mosque again, I didn't have to look for this brother. He was looking for me. Brother First, what can I do for you? Brother First, what can we, what can we do today? And the captain used to ask me, how do you get these brothers to respond like this? 
opposite because I care about them in real life. Like we, we can't take what we do as moving chess pieces on the board as though it's a game and as though it doesn't affect people's real lives. I've been under people's leaderships who have said to me, you, you need to go with us on this detail. I can't go on the detail, I have to work. No, you tell the white man what to do with that job. What? Excuse me, right? So now as a mature person in leadership, whenever we had a detail, I would always say these words. If your boss, supervisor, manager, president, whoever is in charge of you at the place where you work, if they have said these words to you, you have one more time to be late or you have one more time to miss a day, this detail is not for you. It's not for you. Because when we go and we submit ourselves, listen, we don't leave until the job's done. So we may have said, we're gonna shoot down to, I don't know, DC and we're gonna come back tonight. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes we go down on a Sunday, we don't come back until Tuesday because the minister's flight was delayed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you have to put your people in a position to win. So I would take um, profiles. Um, Brother Earl Sixx used to assist me in doing this. We used to pull up Google documents that would have all of the brothers' names on it. I would have in front of me all of their schedules, their work schedules, because what I used to ask them is, what is your schedule for the week? And they would always give me their work schedule. Monday through Friday, I work nine to five, blah, 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 right? So then I would ask a follow-up question. What day and time do you have that I can use you for this work where you don't have to do anything? You don't have to call out. You don't have to stop doing, you know what I mean? You don't have to not do your laundry. You don't have to, what time is that? And some brothers tried to play me, they did. Well, from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., I'm good. But it's a city that doesn't sleep. Mm. So trust and believe one day I'm going to call you on that. <laughs> but, the beautiful part, but the beautiful part of it was because I knew when they were available and when I could uh, bother them at a time that would disturb their life the least, I could sit and make a whole schedule of security for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's visit with over 150 brothers and none of them would have to call out. Mm. Without, without having to call and check with them because I'm only using you in the time that you said that you are available to me. Mm. Mm. So I can set up 24 hour round the clock security at the hotel, at the venue, at this, at the, you know what I mean? I can set up um, rapid response teams, all this stuff. And I'm typing in the names and Brother Earl is in Queens uh, typing in their responsibilities. And then we learned that when giving sensitive instructions, you don't give sensitive instruction to the group. Because that's when people take on quote unquote mixed instructions. So we would have a call, we would have a call and we would let everyone know that their individual instructions would be forthcoming. I'm going to send an individual message just to you that's not to be shared. The person sitting beside you may have a different instruction. It may be something as simple as uh, your uniform, the uniform standard for you on this day is a black linen uh, walking suit. Mm, mm. The person next to you might need a suit and a bow tie. You don't have the same assignment. Don't share or mix the in instruction. So when you give people, when you, what I learned is when you give people, especially the believers, all of the requisite information that they need to complete a task, they will make a better and more informed decision for you. Don't play games with the believers. Don't tell a believer, you know that there's a detail and it doesn't start until five o'clock in the afternoon and we have them showing up at six o'clock in the morning. Mm, mm, mm. You're wasting people's time. I and mean, I don't do that. I don't need everybody at the mosque at nine o'clock. 
it's hard to get Negroes out of their bed to come to the mosque at nine o'clock. So you show up at nine o'clock empty handed, where's your guest? Say, I'm asleep. And then I don't use you until 12, 30, 11. You know what I mean? So if I know that I can have this post covered up until 1.30, I can say to you as an individual, your report time to the mosque, I need you on the check post at one o'clock. What you do with your time before that is up to you, but hopefully you're going to bring a guest because you have more leisure time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can come with your family. When I was the first lieutenant, nobody ever beat me to the mosque. Mm. And I lived the furthest away. Where I live from the mosque is almost equivalent to leaving mosque number seven and driving to mosque number 12. Mm. But I refused to ask the uh, men under my charge to do something that I wasn't willing to do myself. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I didn't send people on call outs. I took people on call outs. And before, I would, before we would take them on call out, we would put our heads together as a staff of lieutenants under the captain, and we would decide what we want, what are the aims of the call out? What are we trying to accomplish? Mm, mm. Are we just trying to sell papers? Are we trying to make converts? Or are we trying to make the streets safe and decent during the time that we're out there? And once you give that information to the people that are under your charge, it helps them make a decision. Because if I've already sold my papers, maybe I don't need to go out there with you. Mm, 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 mm. I'm done. I can spend time with my family. Or maybe you'll say something that I'm inspired and I want to go and help my brother finish his obligation. But bigger than the obligation, the presence of the FOI in the street represents um, a reduction of crime and violence. Well, well, well. So if we never sell a paper, just our presence in the street, we help to reduce violence and crime because nobody's getting raped while we're out there. Nobody's getting robbed while we're out there. Who, who jumping on their wife or their girlfriend in front of us? And if they do, we'll move to stop them. That's what we do out in the street. So we have goals and um, what do you call, what do you call them? Um, not an obligation, it's a, um, what is it when, when the national organization gives you a goal, a quota? We have, we have quotas and we have things that the national organization is trying to get accomplished. And we need to work to accomplish those things. But we have to make those things real. We have to make them more than just numbers. Even though um, all they see is the numbers. Yes, sir. You know, so they'll say that a city like New York is doing great because we put up great numbers. But the individual believer is suffering. You're selling, you know, four or 500 final call newspapers. Great. All praise is due to Allah. You are doing the work. But in this economy, you can't sustain yourself on four or $500 a week. So I have to find something else for you to do. I have to find a way for you to make money. One thing the captain told me, he said, if you can, if you can figure out or find a way for a brother to put money in his pocket and take care of his family, there's nothing that you'll ever ask him that he won't do for you. And I found that to be true. I found that to be true. Because when you take away the need or the, the individual need of the believer, it helps them to be straight so that they're not thinking crooked or trying to figure out how to scheme and, you know, just to put food on their table. We, we have people in every endeavor in our city and in our mosque. Um, now, um, aside from being a lieutenant, it is my desire to help student minister Arthur re-establish um, the nine ministries in New York. Mm -hmm. Because the nine ministries has to be real. We've already started working with the Ministry of Health and Human Services, um, but it's the human services side that is the biggest ministry in our mosque that we need. So I would talk to people and every time I would say, we wanna restart the ministry, we wanna restart the ministry, we wanna, they say to me, the minister said, don't plan anything big. 
He said, just plan to survive. Well, guess what? The ministries are our very survival. Mm, mm, mm. You can't not have a ministry of health if we're at war with an enemy who's killing us. Imagine the people in, um, what is that little place over there that's having a conflict with Russia right now? Ukraine, imagine, Ukraine. Imagine Ukraine citizens are being gunned down in the street and they pick them up and they walk them to the border and they say, excuse me, Russian soldier, can you let us by? We just need to get our wounded to your hospital. Mm, mm, mm. That doesn't make sense. So we have to have our own hospitals. We have to have our own ambulatory services. I, why is there not an ambulance parked in front of our mosque? Mm. We have EMTs in our mosque who are qualified to drive and operate ambulances. The Jews have ambulances in their community. Why don't we have that? Because we haven't organized and extracted from our membership. Everybody is, is reaping the benefits of the wisdom of our members, except us. Human services. Every believer should be assigned a social worker because we have hundreds of social workers in the mosque. Mm, mm. They're not nosy and prying people, but they know how to ask questions to get answers that you and me can't get. If I call you as a lieutenant, brother, how you doing? Fine, sir. But they ask probing questions and find out, yeah, you say you're fine, but when was the last time you ate? What are you eating? What, what are you cooking for dinner? Can what? Oh, mm. no. And there are services that are available to our seniors and, um, you know, we have people that are quote unquote sick and shut in who can't make it to the mosque because of transportation issues. Mm, mm. New York City offers free transportation to seniors. Mm. They just had to plug into it. But it's the social workers who know how to plug into them. I don't know if they have urgent care centers in Atlanta. I'm sure they do. Where instead of going to a regular doctor or a hospital, you go to these urgent care places. Yes, sir. The only thing, the only Thing that you need to open up an urgent care center in New York is a um, nurse practitioner. Guess what? We have one in the mosque. Mm. I think we have two. I think we have two. So the goal and the vision is to see the mosque open up a clinic inside for the believers, for the university students, and etc., and then expand that out into the larger community. Um, I'm in the food truck business. It took me five years to get a license mm. because I couldn't navigate the system. So we need uh, the Ministry of Trade and Commerce. We need to have, we need to set up a uh, chamber of commerce in the mosque to guide the believers, not only into just setting up businesses and so we open them up and then they close, open them up and they close because we can't navigate the system, but someone to be a liaison between us and consumer affairs so that when we have an issue, we have a straight, you know, a straight line to get it corrected. So we don't open up businesses and fail to get a certificate of occupancy and get our stuff thrown into the garbage by the sheriff's department. Same thing with the Ministry of Culture. Ministry of, uh, co um, co of Arts and Culture. We've done this before, but our ideas were, they were fine. We thought that we would expose our children and young adults to the fine arts in museums and plays and stuff like that. But that's not what the minister had in mind, I don't think. Because when he mentioned art and culture, he talked about the communist revolution in China, mm -hmm. where you put our teachings into songs where you put our teachings into the dance, you put our teachings into the play. Why can't we have a sitcom on TV where the, the people just so happen to be Muslim? Mm, mm. It's not necessarily a Muslim sitcom, but they just so happen to be Muslim. So we you know, get to highlight our culture so that they can see our do's more than our don'ts. Because you know, when you come in the mosque, we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do this, we don't do, well, what do we do? We have to show people what we do so that we can be more attractive and more in, uh, inviting to them. I just left, a, um, before I came here on this podcast, I just left a, um, a party where I was DJ, 
gay party. A lot of people that have been in the mosque with me don't even know that I DJ. Mm. I've been DJing since I was 15 years old. Mm, mm. But we don't accept certain parts of each other. But these are the parts that grow our nation because we are more than just a monolithic group of believers. We all believe in the same thing, but our, our expressions are different. Agriculture. We have to figure out, we have to work out the problem of how to get food from the farms to our table. That's bigger than a one person job. We have to figure that out in the cities. We have to open up markets that are direct pipelines from our farms to the shelves so that we can get the stuff to the people. New York is a city that, you know, if you build it, they will come. The way we do, um, the way we were doing the ABLE program didn't work for our city. Mm. Our city doesn't, uh, we don't have a, a city where you put in an order and then a few months later, you get the product. If I order fish on a Tuesday, it's because I want fish on Tuesday night. Mm, mm. So if the fish doesn't come for two months, three months, I've already bought fish. Now I got a freezer full of fish. When that fish shows up, what do I do with it? Mm, mm. But if we built stores, if we built storefronts around the fish program, all you have to do is put it in there. The people are going to come. So those, you know, just just those things. I want us, uh, there's a more pragmatic form of belief that we have to put into practice. Um, I know that there are, um, you know how we say that there's another part for another fellow. Yes, so sir. we never see our part. We just, we're sitting around waiting for our part. But like Dr. Alim suggested when he was on this podcast, so it's like hiding your talents. Master Farad Muhammad came and gave us talents and we're so hell bent on holding on to the talents and keeping them in the same condition that he gave them to us. So when he comes back on his return, we can show him and say, look, I still have the talent, mm. but we didn't grow or multiply the talent. It's time for us to start growing and multiplying these talents. There are some, there are things that plague us in the nation. I can name two right off the bat. Uh, these words, don't change the teachings while I'm gone. That has plagued us mm. because we are so afraid to that we're changing the teachings. When I, when I used to go to study group and as a new member, a person would give an answer and somebody would come behind him and beat him up and say, I don't know, what are you talking about? Where'd you get that brother? The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan didn't say those exact words. That's innovation. So I always thought that innovation was a bad thing. Mm. You've heard it, brother Joshua. Brother, he teaching down the street. That ain't us, that, that's innovation. We're supposed to be innovative. What is a nation that doesn't innovate? What is a nation that doesn't grow off of its base teachings? So because, because that has plagued us, we do nothing. It's not enough that we talk. That, this is another thing that has plagued us because I heard the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan when he said, and this is paraphrase, that the, that the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't commission me to open businesses. I was only commissioned to deliver a clear delivery of the word. That's right. And that's true for him. We're not him, but we've taken on his coloring as though we are the messengers of Allah. Teaching, He's the be, and we are the end it is. Mm, mm. When he says it, we should go and do it. Teaching. Not just repeat it to another people. So we see everybody benefiting from the teachings of the nation, except us. Reverend Willie Wilson, I was there at his last mortgage burning. I said, oh my God, they're burning the mortgage on the church. 
And just as soon as I was thinking that he said, no, this is, we're not burning the mortgage on the church. We're b burning the mortgage on the last property that we mm. own around in this neighborhood. Mm, mm. Those are our teachings. The minister said, Detroit is for sale. It probably ain't for sale anymore. Mm. But what did we do? We ran and we bought Detroit and we did a few renovations and we did what white people do. What we see white people do on TV. We started flipping houses. But I don't think that was his mind. I think he wanted us to buy Detroit, move in and set up our own community. If we were living together amongst each other and not happens, this is the consequence. If this, this is that, this is, and there's, you know, there's no ambiguity. We don't have, you don't have to worry about whether the person who's giving you the law is in a good mood or a bad mood because the law is clear. Mm. And if you don't know it, you should be able to bring someone in with you who knows it. And I think that we have to build a system where our laws, um, not our laws, where the consequences of being outside of the law are more compassionate than punitive. Because a lot of times we throw people into the filth that they want to be in. Mm. Person comes in, he's using drugs. Well, put him out. That's cool. But as a compassionate person, you don't follow him and take him to a treatment program. Mm. Mm. Cause we don't mm. have a treatment program. We don't, you know, and a lot of people have been saved and had their life, their lives changed just based on the word. I know that for a fact. I've seen people's lives change based on the word, but there are some people that the word just doesn't, it can't get through. They need some other form of help first. And I think we should be responsible enough as leaders to take enough interest in the lives of the individual and walk them through that and stay there with them. Um, give you a case. There was a brother in our mosque who transferred um, from Detroit. I'm not going to say his name, but he was on medication. We didn't know what at the time, but we knew that when he wasn't on it, oh, he was crazy as hell. Combative, um, violent, you know, just fight people for no reason. And one day when I was the first, I got a call that he was on 116th Street bugging out. Mm -hmm. So myself and Two, I think two, maybe three other brothers went to body snatch him. Went to pick him up, put him in the car. Everything was fine. Taking him to the hospital. Get him to the hospital. Everything is fine. Called ahead. They know he's coming, you know. Um, we meet the doctor. Then all of a sudden, the security comes down. They start putting on uh, black leather gloves. They about, you know, to handle him. And I said, hey, wait a minute. No, that ain't a good move. One, because we're not going to let you handle him like that. But two, I trained with him. You can't handle him like that. <laughs> He's going to do some major damage in here. So let me walk him to the back for you so you can do whatever, you know, that you do. Right. So we did that. Right. He put me down as his um, person. Um, Sometimes words escape, escape me, but you know, when the hospital, the person that's, that you call when you need some, your emer emergency contact and all yes, that sir. stuff, right? And my, my wife was a hospital social worker at the time, not at that hospital, but at a different hospital. She used to work at that hospital. So she made some calls to people who could look in on them and think, think you know, but he made me his emergency person. So they would call me and I would come in and they would do group therapy sessions with them. And I would go and sit in the group. And I found out that he was born addicted to heroin mm. and a few other substances. So he has a, what, a chemical imbalance. There's some things that his body just will not produce. But we didn't know that before we took that type of interest in his life. Or we want to just put him out. He can't be in here with us. Mm. He's got to go. So I walked him through the program. Every step of the way. Walked him through a housing program. 
walked him through getting people to come to visit every day to make sure that he takes his medication every day. All the brother ever wanted to do was security in the mosque. So everyone, that was his biggest dream in life, to do security in the mosque. So he would come with me everywhere that I would go. And if I ever had a problem, he would take care of it. And the captain used to, it would ask me, brother, what did you do? How did you get him, you know, in this condition? How did you get him better? I make time for bullshit. It's what I do. Because college used to do it. I heard the minister talking about college would get out of his Rolls Royce and sit on the sidewalk with drug with druggies. He had time for it. The minister would do it. I saw videos of him walking the streets of Harlem. Hell, I was present with him walking the streets of Harlem when he did that big campaign out in the streets. Yes, sir. We try, we try to set up, you know, we tried to trick him because we set up venues and soft locations for him to go to and speak, even though that wasn't what he asked for. And he would get out of the car prematurely and walk amongst the people <laughs> and talk to the people mm. because he made time. If he could do it, if he could do it, and he's in the line of divine. That's almost like saying, if God can take time, and why can't you? That's right. So I make time for BS. Uh, and I have a too. genuine concern for the least believer. Beautiful. Powerful, brother Raymond, powerful. And thank you, everyone who's watching. And showing love all across the country. Can't wait to put this on YouTube. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, Brother Raymond, I just want to thank you once again on behalf of myself, my family, and the viewing audience for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on people's podcast. We've been inspired. And I look forward to meeting you in person, inshallah. Praise be to Allah. I hope so, beloved. Yes, sir. It'll be my honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so is... much for, for taking this time with me. Um, I didn't know what you, you know, we were gonna cover here. So, but I pray that there's something on here that believers can use, either good or bad. Um, and I pray that there was something that I said that can uh, inspire someone's life. And if not, you know, use me the, as the example of what not to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, I've been inspired. I'm sure others are as well. This is Joshua Leonard Muhammad signing off of the People's Podcast. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you all for watching.